man, remember the 2010s? What an absolutely insane decade. And many bad things happened in it, but... Uh, this decade is also not off to a great start. I kind of miss the 2010s already. But honestly, 2019 didn't feel like the end of the decade. It felt like the beginning of something else. It might be because the big names of the year were all new artists, but it was one of the freshest and most exciting years I can remember in pop music. It, it felt like one of pop music's big inflection points, like 1992 or 1977, where everything changes. And not only was this one of the most exciting years I covered in music, it was also one of the best. Like, I've had years where the pop charts just do not interest me at all. Some years it's hard to fill out the best list. This year it was hard to make cuts. I really love this list, and it was all really tight. Number eight could have been number two. Any of them would have placed pretty high in weaker years. And the year isn't really over till I release this list, right? So let's put a button on it. We're counting down the top 10 best hit songs of 2019. Number 10. Hey kids, spelling is fun. <laughs> okay, so um. Around the time this fucking thing broke, I predicted that Brendan Urie would become the new Adam Levine. I've had time to swish that thought around in my brain, and uh, I've come up with a better comparison. Panic at the Disco is the new Weezer, in that their stuff clearly became a lot sillier at some point, and we idiot music nerds are doomed to have endless debates about whether they're still good or not. As with Weezer, I adopt an obnoxious middle ground. High hopes. I still think that song's terrible. The lyrics are boring and the sound never comes together. But uh, I like that other single. I guess I was ready for the sequel. Unlike High Hopes, I like this one right away. But it was listening to the whole album that brought me around on Panic! and the Disco as they entered their new, complete and total selling out phase of their careers. Much like Weezer, Yuri threw himself into it like, you know what, fuck it. If this is what we're gonna do, let's go whole hog. What the fuck is this? Like, imagine explaining to any eyelinered hot topic kid in 2006 that their favorite emo band would end up a cheesy lounge act. But Panic was always kind of self-consciously artificial, so it's not as weird a transition as you might think. Are you ready for the sequel? There's a lot of Cobra Starship energy to New Panic, all the glitz and glamour but at a weird angle, like it knows how silly this all is and it leans into it. And Hey Look Ma I Made It is the most explicit song on the album because it's literally about selling out. I'm a hooker selling songs and my pimp's a record label. As proud as he is of his success, he also sounds ambivalent that he made it in such a worthless bullshit arena as popular music. And as someone who's making it in an even more bullshit arena, I'm all into it. And it's that kind of energy and honesty that makes me feel like no matter how far Panic! at the Disco gets from its roots and how pop it goes, maybe Yuri will retain enough self-awareness and personality to not be Adam Levine. We can only hope. Number 9! Back at the start of this decade, I was still working part-time as a substitute teacher. I, I guess he'd call it in the inner city. But yeah, I was like Michelle Pfeiffer, molding vulnerable, innocent mo No, I handed out worksheets and I try not to look too hungover. But I had one very distinct musical memory from this time. These, these three little fourth grade girls singing a song. This one particular song. You guys don't mind? I'm gonna add a little hip hop to this hoedown. Yep, Hannah Montana's Hoedown Throwdown. My point is, the Cyruses have been seeding the ground for this moment for a long time. I got the horses in the back, horse stock is attached. Okay, maybe it's a stretch to credit Miley Cyrus for Old Town Road, but look at it. Hannah Montana is out there teaching a whole generation of kids to mix rap and country. Nine years later, the now-grown kid behind the biggest country rap song of all time handpicks Hannah Montana's father to put it over the top. Combine that with the Jonas Brothers comeback, the shockwaves from 2000's Disney are gonna keep reverberating. Who knows what the effects are gonna be. So what do we do now, now that Old Town Road is officially the biggest song in pop history? Where do we go from here? Will it turn out to be like CeeLo's Fuck You? A novelty song we all thought was gonna be more important than it was and later we'll all be like, wait, why were we all wearing chaps in 2019? 
Or is this, in fact, the game changer everyone thinks it is? Maybe it is the next Royals or Despacito. I don't know. This is relatively low on the list because it took me a long time to get on the horse-drawn bandwagon. I'm still a little suspicious of it and kind of sympathetic to anyone who never took to it. Like, what an obnoxious year this must have been for them. And the Old Town Road outrage and discourse was just miserable to be involved with. For what it's worth, the whole idea that there was going to be some kind of racist backlash against it, I think it was really overstated. I'm sure there's at least a little, but in my experience, white people like it when black people like the things they like. And the country fandom, old, young, whatever, they seem to be pretty okay with it. It's just a hard song for anyone to not enjoy. And yeah, there's a part of me that still doesn't quite believe the hype, but fuck it. I just decided to let the masses sweep me away on this one. I love that pop music is just this amazingly insane and unpredictable where a silly song like this can be imbued with so much importance. Plus it has one of the most killer choruses ever written. And when that beat drops for Billy Ray's verse and then it comes back in... Maserati sports car Got no stress I Fuck yeah! Greatest two seconds of the year. Like a Marlboro man so I keep going back There's just something magical about this whole phenomenon. Some accidental genius we'll never see again. Nashville is now trying to reverse engineer Lil Nas X's success. Do the two step and cowboy boogie Grab a sweetheart and spin out with him no, it's not the same thing. Will we see Lil Nas X in 2020? We'll see. But 2019 will always be his before it's anyone else's. Number eight. Bust down, bitch. One of the big stories of music 2019 was the explosion of female rappers. For years, the only woman in the game was Nicki and for a brief period Iggy, which I think we all regret. Other than that, it was a total sausage fest. Once Cardi arrived, it was, you know, thank God, a challenger for the title. But unfortunately, Nicki fell right out of everyone's good graces, so that one had a clear winner. But all of a sudden, it seemed like we realized we don't have to have just one woman. Hip-hop isn't the Smurfs. So it's nice that the race to be queen of hip-hop stayed competitive. Not that it's actually a competition. But you know, if it was, then it quickly became clear that the main event would be Cardi versus Lizzo, and it was gonna be hard to pick the winner. I have thoughts about who I'd pick, but as part of the fairness doctrine, I am required to ask, have you considered voting third party? Old Town Road will always have the weirdest path to success that year, but the story of Megan Thee Stallion's biggest hit, Hot Girl Summer, was also kind of odd, starting out as a meme long before it was a single. And I acknowledge that it is hard to turn a catchphrase into a song. I didn't do it. Perhaps it would have been best to leave it as a slogan rather than cash in on it. By the time Hot Girl Summer came out, the summer was almost over. So it was more like a tribute to the Hot Girl Summer that was in the past. But who am I to complain about anyone putting out their work late? And besides, most great summer songs are about summer as a memory. Summer of 69, Boys of Summer, Summer Girls, forever a classic. Honestly, I loved Hot Girl Summer immediately. I saw plenty of critics who were disappointed, and the big complaint was that the Hot Girl Summer was supposed to be about being hot for yourself, not for any dudes. So there shouldn't be a dude on the song. Big old freak, it's a must that I hit. It's Frankly, I didn't mind at all. The hook is great, but at the same time, it was kind of not that important. Ty Dolla Sign, who is doing a decent Drake impression here, I think he understands that he's here to be the hype man for Megan, and otherwise he is to get the fuck out of the way. Handle me? Who gon' handle me? Thinking he's a player, he's a member on the team. I admit, the meme floating around as an all-purpose empowerment slogan probably helped sell the song to me, because Megan raps mostly about herself and not, you know, the other hot girls of that summer. Hey, I got one or two days. If you seen it last night, don't say shit the next day. And yet it felt like she didn't need to. The song just feels good. Even Nicki Minaj, whose career is clinging to life at the moment, is an entirely welcome presence here. He says, how come summer we ain't talking about degrees? For once, she seems to be getting along with other women. She even bothered to show up for the video instead of having to be digitally inserted like usual. I'm a hot girl, so you know it should stop me. Hot Girl Summer felt like that last really great pool party of the year before school starts. So let's let 2019 live on in our memory as the year of the Hot Girl Summer. 
we will tell our grandkids one glorious year this summer had nothing but hot girls. And after that, nothing but miserable asshole winter. <laughs>
but I cherish this completely made up false memory regardless. Being on the road with Amanda, my imaginary girlfriend, without a care in the world, it was amazing. I couldn't turn Posty has always mixed different genres, but Circles feels like the only 100% non-hip-hop song he's ever made. Like, even his most poppy songs, he kept like a toe in rap. They'd have the drowsy hip-hop beats behind it. I'm starting to gain an appreciation for him as a rapper, but if he only made stuff like Circles for the rest of his life, I don't think I'd complain. In fact, part of people's distrust of Post Malone is that he came to hip-hop relatively late. He originally wanted to be a rock singer, and the fact that he's actually kinda good at it might not actually help his case. Get out of hip-hop, you poser! You're really good at making folky indie pop. We don't want you to miss your true calling. And what gets me is that Ed Sheeran is also a guy who keeps trying to do everything. He keeps chasing those pop hits. And this is what he could be making instead, but he keeps trying to inch as close as he can to being a rapper, and an actual rapper is making the acoustic pop songs that he should be. For what it's worth, I also like Post Malone's weird singing voice and his bizarre vibrato. I don't know how he does that, he's like, is he part goat? But for a guy who's mostly known for being mopey and downbeat, he can put a lot of emotion into it. Post Malone is a guy who's easy to hate, but I absolutely do not hate him. This is like perfect early 70s Laurel Canyon guitar pop, and I like it way too much. Still number one in the country as I'm recording this, completely deserved. Run away, run away, run away. These year ends are really exhausting, by the way. We're gonna take another break. Oh god, I just remembered what I put at number five. Check out the next video, everyone.